Thank you for joining us for this afternoon's panel discussion. I'd like to introduce Dr. Stuart Carlton, who will be facilitating our discussion. Dr. Carlton is the Assistant Director for the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant Program, and he's also a Research Assistant Professor and Head of the Coastal and Great Lakes Social Science Lab in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at Purdue University. He and his students research the relationship between knowledge, values, trust, and behavior in complex and controversial environmental systems. Dr. Carlton holds a PhD in interdisciplinary ecology from the University of Florida. But most importantly, he's the host and executive producer of Teach Me About the Great Lakes, a podcast in which he, a Southerner, asks smart people to teach him about the Great Lakes. And in that capacity, he's perfectly suited to host our panel today and learn more, help us all learn more about our keynote invited speakers and panelists and what they feel about the issues surrounding emerging contaminants. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Carlton. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate that. Um, good, and so since Carolyn's on here, one thing Carolyn and I, Carolyn also is part of the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant team, and she works with me closely on teaching me about the Great Lakes and other stuff. And because she works with me closely, she is unafraid to let me know if things aren't going right, uh, which is good. So Carolyn, if everything is okay on your end, good. If not, send Sarah a text. <laughs> yeah. All right. So before we get going on this panel, thank you, first of all, for coming in. I want to set just sort of the scene a little bit in terms of how I hope the panel is going to work. And then from there, uh, we can we can get started. So I think panels work best. So we have a lot of experts here in a lot of different things, right? And so we're going to spend most of this time learning from the perspective of our keynote speakers. Um, but I think we can also have a discussion. So there will be time, or not even time, but during the thing, we can have questions. I think there's a mic over there. Is that right, Sarah? That is hooked up to the Zoom. Uh, we can have questions. We can have comments. We can have a couple of questions that are really more of a comment. But if that if that's your mode, just make the comment. It's okay. You don't have to phrase it as a question to facilitate discussion. Um, especially as we move into there. And um, because we're also doing this in Zoom, if somebody notices the Zoom people chiming in and I don't because I can't see the chat and stuff like that, uh, you can make that a comment. Uh, you can just go ahead and let me know. And um, I think for the start, if you have a point to make, we'll do the hand raise thing. We'll see how that's going um, after the initial sort of round of, of uh, introductions and stuff like that. And if something else works better, then we'll do something else. We're going to learn together. And then the last sort of... Um, setting the same thing I want to do is I'm also this afternoon giving the uh, closing remarks briefly because nobody wants long closing remarks after a conference but I'm going to preview them right now which is to say to Sarah and Beth we're really uh, uh, blazing a trail here right uh, you know the hybrid conferences I've been to have been hosted by these enormous groups that charge four figures to even grace their presence and so we're learning how to do this on a small scale and so I think that um, is this being recorded I think you're kicking butt um yeah and so uh uh you know i i think that uh and and you're sort of creating uh this idea of what a hybrid conference might be and i was talking earlier with someone we're in this uncomfortable period right where we're learning what that is and the thing that stinks again because we're recording about uncomfortable periods is they're kind of uncomfortable right and so we're going to emerge from the end of this like uh popeye upon eating a can of spinach uh, stronger uh, down the line. But so thank you to Sarah and Beth. And I'm going to say that exact same thing again later. So I apologize for repeating myself. But, uh, you know, once they give you the PhD, you earn the right to do that. So enough about me, because this is not about me. This is about our attendees. So what we're going to do is um, we want to focus this conversation around the idea of uh, emerging contaminants and sort of the interaction between the research that we do as scientists and the real world, right? And that could take a lot of different shapes. So, you know, seeing our science as uh, something that is being used by people. Who are the people? It could be a lot of different people. It could be policymakers. It could be practitioners. Uh, it could be uh, J and Q six pack, right? Um, is that me? Do I need to turn this off? Yeah, let's swing it. All right, great. And Zoom, Carolyn, thumbs up if you can still hear me. Thank you. Okay. That's worse. Should I take this? Let me turn off my, uh, if I'm going to be standing up here, I'll turn off my live mic. All right. Now, thumbs up again, Carolyn, if you can still look at that. All right, thanks. John, you can give thumbs up, too, if you can hear me. All right, good. We don't care about the rest of Zoom as long as you all can hear. Okay. Um, I'm just kidding. We do care about you deeply. All right. 
so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start with a round of introductions, right? And, and, and I know we've heard from some of these people before, but people have been in different sessions, had different cocktail chatter with different people. So uh, what I'd like to do, panelists, and I'll, I'll call on you one at a time so that we're all taking turns, is um, I'd like to talk about maybe like a success story. Uh, describe your expert expertise and maybe a success story about how your research was used by some relevant group. We're not even going to be directive in terms of what that looks like, but just to sort of set the scene on who we are, what we do, and we're going to start uh, with Ray, please. Um, hello, I, am I, on? I think so. Um, am I on now? Yeah. I am on now. Uh, so, uh, oh, maybe we can't like all have our mics on at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> we're figuring it out, right? <laughs> um, so I am Ray McNish, and I gave an invited lecture yesterday, a uh, uh, seminar yesterday. And I'm a freshwater ecologist, which might make me a unicorn in the room. I'm not sure about that. There's a lot of chemist folks in here. <laughs> um, and so my research really just broadly falls under understanding terrestrial aquatic connections, especially understanding how changes in the landscape impact our freshwater resources. Uh, and so that's just kind of like broadly. But um, when I was talking yesterday, I was focusing on the plastic pollution um, work that we've been doing, but I, my research also includes impacts on invasive species and is expanding to also include cattle grazing impacts on streams as well. Uh, so that will, that's my introduction. And then second part was a success story. Success story, let's be positive. Um, so this is not going to be linked with an emerging contaminant, um, but I Spent all of my graduate work studying an invasive plant, uh, Lister macchiai, commonly called Amora honeysuckle. And um, when I was a master's student uh, doing this litter decomposition project in a stream, I was hiking over 50 parks to find sites. And I noticed that the terrestrial management for this invasive riparian plant uh, was to just spray the plant with like Roundup and let it die. And its branches will just like stay there in the riparian area. Um, some parks would clear cut the plant, uh, but there seemed to be kind of a, a hodgepodge of strategies that managers were doing. So in my PhD, we mimicked one of the strategies, which was clear cut and apply an herbicide. And this showed us within one growing season uh, that there was an explosion of herbaceous growth and a lots of recovery of uh, native, but also in some other invasive herbs and shrubs. And this also led us to understand that complete removal of the invasive shrub is way more important than just killing it and letting the woody shrub part stay there because it actually acts as a physical barrier preventing leaf litter and root debris from our upper native canopies from entering our streams. And that's important food and habitat for aquatic organisms. And so now that we know all of this and been able to do this research in the past that I've done with park managers and communicate with them directly, they are now better positioned to make better management strategies that can have a more positive impact, just not just on the terrestrial environment, but also in the streams. And then we did start seeing managers starting to take this information into account, which was really kind of nice after seven years of research. Thanks, and then we'll move online. We're gonna ping pong that way, if that's okay. Um, and uh, uh, John, you are on my left and I read left to right. So if you could start, please, that'd be great. Sure, great. So hi, I'm Jonathan Patali. I'm a toxicologist with the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Um, so a lot of my work is focused on human health risk assessment, but I also do ecological risk assessment in my role here. And, you know, I think if I, was to come up with an example of sort of successful application of my research. It's a little bit combination of successful application of my research and the research of others. So I work in a regulatory agency. I'm not purely a research scientist. And being that I come from New Hampshire, um, we are the live free or die state, which also roughly translates into, we have a fairly libertarian bias up here. We don't like the government mandating things. So oftentimes as a state agency, we don't have a lot of sticks to use. So we're trying to find carrots. And I think one of the really successful applications of research that I've seen in my work is trying to find ways to improve risk communication to 
broader audiences. So they're actually aware of emerging contaminants. So my example of that is in the last couple of weeks, I've done a lot of outreach and engagement with various grocery association groups, um, real estate agent lobbies, and a nurse practitioners association in our state. And you know the thing that they all have in common is they're all interested in understanding PFAS and exposure and how they can help people reduce their exposure to those. So a lot of that translational work, I think, is really impactful, especially when you, know, you may be in an area where there's not a strong culture maybe for passing top-down regulations, but maybe if you can get people to start changing some of their behaviors or at least just have some more awareness of a topic, it can make a difference. Um, so yeah, that would be my example. Thank you for that, John. And I will come back in the room with you. Hi, I'm Dr. Latonya Jackson, for those of you who don't remember me, but um, I am an environmental toxicologist. So my field in itself is very interdisciplinary. Um, one of my success stories, and um, I, th I think I talked about it a little bit because someone asked me a question after um, my talk. So I'm gonna hear it again if you've heard it before. But um, there was a, uh, the Cincinnati City Council was trying to um, put artificial turf on children's baseball fields and soccer fields because they were um, saying that having natural grass was just be, being a nuisance. It was bothersome. And um, they were tired of like the mud and all this other stuff and maintenance work that they had to do. So um, I got with a group of other um, scientists and practitioners. So there was a social scientist, there was myself, the environmental toxicologist, there was a um, pediatrician and there was a uh, human toxicologist. So we got together and we met with the Cincinnati City Council and we talked to them about uh, PFAS and how it was in those artificial turfs and the consequences of it and um, over long periods of time, especially, you know, with um, having it as a turf for children to use and how dangerous it would be for them later on. So um, we, we went to their meeting, they led us to presentations to quote unquote educate them. We didn't stop there. Um, <laughs> we actually met with the uh, community as well. Um, it wasn't all of us, it was a couple of us. We met with the community as well. We educated them on what PFAS would do. And when it was time for the committee, um, the council members to vote, the whole community was there and they made such an uproar and it didn't pass. So that was, man, that was that's, um, one of my biggest success stories as of late. Carolyn, thank you. Thanks, can you hear me over here? Oh. We cannot quite hear you. Keep talking. I'll keep talking online. I think they can hear me okay, but yep. in the room. Good now. Okay, thank you. Um, so my name is Carolyn Foley. Um, I'm trained as an aquatic ecologist, but I was asked to be part of this panel in my role as research coordinator for Illinois Indiana Sea Grant. So the main purpose of my job is um, to help run research competitions where we receive funding from the US federal government to pass out to researchers um, working on issues that are important. Um, and Sea Grant as a whole, it's an organization that um, is across the United States in all of the coastal states, um, also in Puerto Rico and Guam. Um, and one of the things they have focused on for a very long time is, I think the term we're using now is kind of actionable science. So it tends to be that um, projects that review well have a plan like what Dr. Jackson just mentioned, that you're going to go out into the community or what Dr. Patali said, um, where there, there aren't if there are a couple of steps between the information being used by a group and you know it being generated right now, that can be OK. But really, it's probably like only two or three steps away from someone using it that tends to 
to review the best. And I think a lot of other funding organizations are stepping toward this model with kind of making sure that the re research that's being conducted um, is being useful to the communities um, that could learn from it. Um, I found it kind of funny that uh, Dr. McNish said that they were going to share uh, something that was not linked to a CEC because I was also looking back at the projects that we've funded. And I think projects that are focusing on contaminants of emerging concern, it's tricky because it takes a while to find out, okay, here's something that came out. What are the problems? What do we, I mean, earlier today, um, we heard from this, John, I think was the speaker who said that there may be some regrettable quotes that go out or things like that. So um, it's really hard to find one, but the, so the example that I'm giving is a research project that we funded looking at green stormwater infrastructure. Um, so the work that we funded was it was um, the PI was Mary Pat McGuire, who's at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign there. And she was interested in looking at soils. And if you want to implement green infrastructure, um, really for it to work well, you have to know what the soils are. Um, and I would say, you know, ultimately she worked with uh, Margaret Schneemann and Eliana Brown of Illinois Indiana Sea Grant to create a tool. So she went from kind of mapping the soils and understanding what types of stormwater infrastructure, green stormwater infrastructure would work well where, to creating a tool that communities can use that like it helps them know, okay, when is it good to use these types of plants or other types of plants? Um, but really, I think the reason it was a success was that she was getting in with communities right from the beginning, um, making sure that the maps that she was generating and things like that would be useful to them. That was also a huge challenge because she didn't necessarily know how to work in that space. And so having the partners in the extension world um, to help her navigate that space, I think was really important. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, and thanks all four of our panelists. So, so the first question I have, I think applies to all of them and I'll, I'll call on one person and then feel free to chime in or whatever, right? But so, uh, Ray, it seems to me like the challenge I hear from a lot of this is building trust, right? So you're coming in from, from a lab or whatever, you're trying to go to these communities, um, maybe as an outsider, maybe as an insider, um, but but you've got to build, you've got to build, as a, a, a colleague of mine says, you've got to build the bridge of trust that can bear the weight of the truth, right? And so how do you, how do you build that bridge of trust when you're coming from a very technical background? Um, has that been something that you've been able to do? And if so, how? The bridge of trust is one I've been trying to cross since I've moved and started my new position. Um, I've been um, pre-tenure faculty at Cal State University in Bakersfield, and when I moved to there, so I'm from Northeast Pennsylvania, I did all my graduate and postdoc work here in the upper Midwest, um, and I really had no experience in terms of California, um, the political platform, and what the communities there really needed in terms of their science and research, and um, there, because freshwater is such a rare and very precious resource in the Southwest because it's a very arid climate. Um, someone who comes in and studies um, a facet of research related to contaminants is not actually very welcome to that community. And when I say that community, I don't mean like the locals because the locals are want more work done on the freshwater to help get more water in our river, for example but getting those permissions and bail, building those bridges of trust with the people in power that I have to get the permits for has been a major challenge. And so one way that I've been working on, it's also been challenging because most of my time in the past five years has been a pandemic. So it's been hard to actually get to know people like in person and build those personal relationships. Um, but I've been part starting to build relationships and partner with local, environmental activist groups uh, because they have built those bridges of trust with the people who have the power to give the permissions and the permits. Um, so like partnering with a local group called Bring Back the Kern, which is focused on bringing water back into the Kern River 
um, a bit more frequently uh, and partnering with, um, there's the Kern River Parkway Foundation, there's the Sierra Club, our local activist group. Uh, and then also we have Tahoe Branch Conservancy, uh, which is named after the um, tribe Tahoe, which there are still folks uh, from the tribe living locally. And the Tahoe Branch Conservancy is the largest private continuous conservancy in the United States. So I've been able to build these relationships with folks that have these bridges of trust that are starting to connect my bridge to theirs. And that's really what I've been working on. Integrating with local groups, great. All right, so for me, um, I take a lot of different approaches um, because I look like the communities that I serve. Um, I think I have an advantage, but I actually do a lot of prep work. So I'll go into the communities before I even start um, doing sampling or doing the work. And what I do when I go in the communities, I just um, you know go to my sample sites and just kind of walk around and you know, get a lay of the land, the water. And um, I usually go, I try to go when there are lots of people around because I work with water. So um, water is usually a recreational tool for a lot of people. So I usually go, um, try to go when there's peak times. And um, as I'm looking, just start talking to people that are there. I also go to um, Chamber of Commerce, City Council meetings. I do look for advocacy groups as well. Not um, every community has an advocacy group, but if they do, I definitely connect with them. And, um, and also I do all of this before I start sampling. And that way they kind of get used to seeing me around. And, um, you know, they can talk to me. Um, I think I'm friendly. So, um, you know, we, we have, uh, you know, regular conversations. And I let them know what I'm planning to do and why I'm planning to do it and how it's going to help them and uh, or at least how I think it's going to help them and answer all of their questions at um, not so technical, but just being like, hey, well, I'm looking to see like what's in this water so that when you go in it, you don't come out with let's say like a skin rash. If there's certain chemicals in there, you may not see it immediately, but if you keep using the water all, all, you know, all summer or over the years, you may see something happen. And I just want to make sure that your water is okay. And um, so that's that's pretty much how I do it. And like I said, the prep time, it takes time, but um, it's worked for me so far. So. And is that prep time challenging? Because, I mean, you're a busy faculty member, right? And, and I mean, you've got to publish papers and, and I, I'm not sure if you have a teaching appointment or not, but if so, you got to teach. Like, like, is it hard to work that into your schedule? Or do you, I assume you find that the trade-off's worth it regardless, but do you find that to be a challenge? No, because when I'm doing the research, I factor that in. So if I did not factor that in, yes, it would be a challenge. But um, it's very rare that I get to do research on like something big that just happened, like the train derailment or BP oil spill or something like that. So um, before that, I'm usually planning anyway. So why not add this into the plan? Okay. Thank you. But John, I imagine your perspective on this is interesting because you're also a regulator. And I, I imagine the trust relationship with regulators, uh, well, probably depends on who you're talking to, um, but it could get interesting at times. Do you have thoughts on, on how to build trust with people that you're regulating and or uh, in communities that you're researching? Yeah, so I think for both of those, it one of the things that was challenging for me coming into my role, so I've only been here for almost five years now, which is kind of weird to say. Um, but, you know, coming in anytime I go with my team or other members of our state agency staff to a public meeting, depending on each and every community, they may or may not have some existing experience or history with the state agencies coming in. Um, so, you know, building trust with a small community that this is the first time they're interacting with us and we're throwing them a free well water testing event where everyone's gonna get their well tested. And if they have issues, we'll help provide rebates to treat everything. That's pretty, that's a really easy community to build a trust bridge there because we're coming in and that's a great situation. 
going into a community like Merrimack, New Hampshire, where there has been a history of, you know, initially discovering this and the state was caught on its back foot, not knowing what PFAS were, not knowing the extent of this, not knowing what treatment options were available, scrambling to get bottled water out to people that same day, and then having multiple meetings of saying, we don't know, we're not sure. Or the thing that a lot of community members don't like and don't sometimes understand is we haven't done anything because there's no law or regulation that allows the state to take any action, which can be confusing for some folks that you know, they're asking, you know, you're a state agency, you're supposed to be protecting public health, but there have been some cases where we simply don't have that legal authority. And that's not a satisfying answer. And that's already something where when folks are dealing with an emerging contaminant, there's already a lot of emotions going on. There's fear, there's anger. So in the past, we've had situations where you know, you can look up historical recordings from people at our agency having these meetings with the public. In some cases, they were doing the right things and providing what we know, what we don't know, what we are doing. But we also had some people that would respond, you know, to yelling residents by saying, hey, I can't understand you when you're yelling. Like, that's not a way to react to people that are in a situation that just found out their water was contaminated. So, What's been hard in some cases is we're trying to go back and build trust with these communities. And it's really hard with emerging contaminants because with all the information that keeps changing, especially around something like PFAS, it creates some mistrust in the community when we come in and we knew, we knew fact A last week and now it's fact B. And for the lay public that doesn't understand that science changes like that and it keeps evolving, it can be really difficult to build trust around. Thank you. Uh, and we have our, our fourth panelist is in, or fifth. As I said last night, I dropped out of the certain major to avoid chemistry. Maybe I should have dropped out before the math or kick in. So while Zhang Yu is getting ready, I'm curious, anybody in the audience, do you have a story to tell or a, a thought on, on um, developing trust within communities that you're working in. Uh, if so, we can bring the mic over. And I'm going to periodically ask the audience for questions because um, Sarah put me in charge, and so that's what I'm going to do. And so uh, if, if uh, and I warned her, too. Um, if you'd like to make a comment or thought on that, if anybody has a group that they've worked with where they, it's gone really well, or maybe even better, one where it, it was a struggle, we would love to hear that, that story as well. Just uh, you can put your hand up. And while you're thinking about that, Chen Yu, if you could take a second to reintroduce yourself and we're talking about trust within communities and and how do we build that but if you want to start with an overview of uh who you are and like a success story of working with an end user of, of science out of your science that would be great yes um so first up my apologies i i messed up with my time because i didn't realize the one hour time difference before coming here i'm sorry about that um yeah so um things about community engagement, right? Um, is that the question, right? Um, uh, yeah, 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 yes. Okay, um, so uh, for my previous experience in like Washington State University, uh, Washington, that's like pretty good because, uh, you know, the local people are really enthusiastic about salmon protection, salmon recovery. And uh, we also uh, being like very transparent and try to get everything we know to them. And uh, yeah, the support we got like in return was awesome because not only the volunteers tell us where we can have like a mortality event, but also we have samplers set up in someone's like backyard and for a whole day. So that's the kind of like, you know, I think like really the mutual benefit. Uh, we kind of like want to keep our field work, keep our uh, kind of like sampling in those communities. In return, we tell them what's going on. And the result was clearly very good because the result, uh, you know, we got what's causing the problem and uh, they now know what's going on. So they also feel like they are part of the science endeavor. So that's kind of like what I uh, got.
All right, good. Um, well, in thinking about working with the public, another thing, it's related to trust. I know we're not just going to touch on all the things that I do in my lab with regards to research. We're going to touch on most of them, though. Um, and I just think about communicating with the public. So you work in really technical fields, right? And, and you're talking about literally working with children. And so you gave kind of a graphic example of, I'm testing, uh, Latanya, you gave a graphic example of, I'm testing this water so that you don't get a rash, which is one way to contextualize your science, right? Thinking about that end product. Are there other sort of um, ways in which you try to contextualize your science for non technical audiences, because when I hear about these emerging contaminants, like what did, what did uh, John say last night? It was a cup in Lake Michigan, right? Um, was that the PFAS? I don't remember what it was. Yeah, uh, so that's not, a, that's not an understandable amount for me, right? I mean, I know what a cup is and I know what Lake Michigan is, um, but uh, anyway, and so, so it's really hard to contextualize. Do you have any thoughts on how you do that or other, other things that you do to try to help people understand in a meaningful way your work? I'll start with you. Okay, so uh, my work has to do a lot with um, endocrine disruptors. That's you know where my focus is. But um, when it comes to educating the community, I don't just stay on that focus. It's, it's whatever you know is bothering that community or whatever they're burdened with um, that I'm qualified to educate them on. So for something like PFAS or um, forever chemicals, you know, um, I tend to tell them where's, where it is, where it's coming from, like basically it's everything that you do, but everything that you have almost, and you can reduce your exposure. And I let them know like over long periods of time, you know, like, hey, this is what um, we as scientists are seeing. Like, you know, we're, we're able to measure these chemicals, like in pregnant women, we're able to measure those chemicals in a placenta. So, you know, this is being transferred to developing, you know, you're developing babies and stuff like that. So um, it doesn't have to be always about a skin rash, <laughs> but, um, but you know, just, just letting them uh, know in the simplest terms or wherever it is that they are, because a lot of the communities are, I find, are very educated already. You know, they... Um, social media is out there. So, you know, you, you get a lot of truths, but you get a lot of untruths. So um, I'm asked a whole lot of questions. Um, and I, for the most part, it's very rare that I actually have to do all the educating. It's like, they're asking me questions. And sometimes it's like, oh my God, like y'all are on it, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's just you meet you meet the the community where they are and realize that they're not all on the same plane. So you you start from wherever it is that you start, which me is the simplest form, and then I just feed off of um, whatever it is that they're asking me. So that's how I tackle that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Right, are you about to chime in? I think so. Yeah, I have. Uh like a couple of like examples that I try and build and that like, like analogies people can like relate with in their daily life. So for example, when I sample rivers or sediment for microplastics, um, be able to say there's, you know, 20 particles per liter. My mother doesn't understand what that means at all. And so a lot of folks, but if I do the math myself and convert it to the, you know, the average above ground swimming pool can hold like, you know, was 11 cubic meters of water. And I can do that math. And I just say, this is how much plastics, your particles you're swimming in, or your child is drinking, you know, and usually the audience, or if I'm like just talking to someone while I'm at like a boat launch and they're like, what are you doing? You know, they can connect with that because they understand what a volume of a swimming pool is. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, another activity that I do, because again, the concept sometimes of trophic, use that phrase, trophic transfer doesn't really connect with like people in my family and whatnot. And so when we do these like outreach activities um, for like science day and whatnot, I have these wooden nesting dolls and, um, and on the outside of them, we've printed off like pictures for different positions in the food web. And, um, and, you know, a child or an adult will come and be like, well, what's this nesting doll? And so we have them like, well, and they take them apart and they can see, you know, the human eats the fish inside the fish is like a, a smaller fish inside that is like 
plankton. We use like the plankton character from SpongeBob. Okay. So people can connect with that. And inside the plankton is like plastic essentially, right? And so they understand like this physical hands-on activity and seeing it without saying the word trophic transfer. Oh, because this eats this, eats this, and you eat that you know, it's, um, you know, it's part, they can connect with that. So I think it's important to find these analogies that connect with people's everyday lives, trying to get them to understand what our research is about. Yeah. And in a moment, I'm going to ask if anybody else has a favorite way of making it real and see if we can beat Rus Russian nesting dolls. Um, but I see you, Carolyn, but before I do, folks online, uh, folks with an X, online. Uh, you can type questions into the Q&A of the Whova agenda item for this panel and, and operators are standing by monitoring that. So if you have questions, comments, notes, uh, that would be great. Carolyn, uh, you were going to come up with a way of making something real or comment on Ray's. Um, basically, I was going to do something um, aside, like kind of tangential to that. Um, I think the people on this panel are really awesome science communicators, like really great scientists and also really awesome science communicators. I just wanted to make a plug for anybody in the room who feels like, because I mean, for a long time, I worked on, you know, lower trophic level organisms. Um, and people would be like, no one cares. Like they, they want to worry about the fish. They don't care about, you know, so how can, you know, we, we would joke about making placards like save the plankton, but um, I can imagine that, you know, with all the acronyms and the different types of chemicals coming out and, you know, um, that it would be really tricky to potentially find those connections um, quite as easily. But there are some really great people in the world, like science communicators or extension staff, um, who could potentially partner with you. So if you're a really, really fantastic scientist and you're not really sure how to make your um, your findings relatable or things like that, there are people out there who can help. I think an important message is that not everybody has to, I think everyone has to be willing to share what they're finding, but if you have trouble translating it, to contextualize it for people. There are a lot of people out there who are, are willing to help. And um, the only other thing I was gonna add is I struggle with microplastics in particular because on the one hand, it's like, to me, one of the easiest things for people to understand that like what I use every single day can wind up in the environment. Like I know that I have this plastic bag here or different things like that, but then there's huge debate in the scientific community like should we be paying attention to microplastics versus other chemicals um so i think that's something to keep in mind too when when scientists are having really good conversations that you know people might pick it up and run with it and say oh microplastics aren't a big deal well that's not necessarily the case um but just you know kind of contextualizing the conversations that are happening too i think is important thanks thank you carolyn Anybody else have a way that they'd like to make something real when they're communicating their science? And I'll invite our panelists or, or of course, the audience as well, if somebody out there wants to give us their favorite way of, of making something real. And while you're thinking about that, I'll chime in with there's someone at Sea Grant. Actually, Karen, I have a question for you after I tell this story. Um, there's someone at Sea Grant, Michigan Sea Grant, her name is Megan Goss, and she has like this sort of suit made out of plastic bags. That she'll, if you ask her nice, she'll show up to your event in it. And uh, it's, <laughs> I don't know what it is exactly, but it really makes it real. So Carolyn, you say the one thing is to try to partner with people. And of course we work for Sea Grant and for those who don't know what Sea Grant does, a big chunk of what we do is outreach and extension related to science, right? That's about a third or two thirds of what we do depending on who you're asking. Um, but but are, do you have suggestions for people on how to find someone to partner with? Because you know not everybody works in a coastal or Great Lakes state with a Sea Grant program or Guam or uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, and, and, um, and, and so not everybody works at a land grant university where we have all of these resources, right? So do you have thoughts on, on that, Carolyn, in terms of how to find somebody to help communicate with? So I think, um, and this is coming from a place of not being super knowledgeable. So um, I, but I will give what I do know and then maybe some people in the room or online can add to it. Um, even just in Canada, I hear, so I'm originally from Canada and people have said they don't necessarily have a clear group to work with. There are, I think science communicators are probably 
available most places because I mean we have like a worldwide audience in this conference too right um it was really cool to hear people giving presentations from um the UK or different other places um so I think I would look for science communicators first and kind of getting a feel for you know how they are conveying information and complex ideas and kind of um really is translating. I don't think it's distilling down necessarily. It's translating. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think this is also just a pitch for organizations and around the world to see value in that kind of role, that not every scientist is going to be able to easily translate things. They may be an amazing scientist, and there may always be more acronyms and jargon that like um, they just I don't know how to say this, but anyway, I hope you guys are sort of understanding. I think um, I don't know what there what opportunities there are in other countries, um, so I don't know that I can make that suggestion. But I'd be happy to hear if anybody else can. John has some his hand up. Yeah, so this is kind of coming from a non university perspective. Um, so when I first came up to New Hampshire, I was trying to figure out how to find some of those very partnerships because. I came from all the way out in Nebraska to New Hampshire, so I didn't know what resources were at any of the universities. I didn't even really know what the other state agencies did. Most of them, I couldn't even tell you what their titles were. I just knew where I worked. Um, but one of the sort of approach, the little thought experiment that I've time and time again used is imagining if I was up there at the podium right now, who would it scare the crap out of me the most if they raised their hand in the back of the room and asked a question? And how do I get that person onto the project early on? So that way they're there for planning it, figuring out what our goals are, how we're going to reach out to them as an audience. And I guess that's sort of the question back to like, I guess for some of the folks, like the other panelists, like, you know, are there people in your communities or in your states or in your regions that you think, you know, I've never really invited them into projects or I've never really involved them, like whether it's a state regulator, federal or certain community groups. But if you if you can make the dream happen, you know, who could you bring to the table to partner with you on a project? You know, in our case, we've been trying to work a lot with the local universities because they have knowledge. But more and more right now, we're starting to work with certain legislatures and community advocacy groups to develop fact sheet materials for clinicians because we're realizing that's a need that they want and we're wanting to try to involve them in that process. All right. So, um, another thing that I like to do is actually invite teachers, uh, to be honest with you, science teachers. Um, in elementary school, junior high and high school, because they are used to communicating, you know, with um, with children and uh, with people at different ages. So they make great uh, scientific communicators, especially if you can get them to understand what it is that you're doing, then um, they do a great job at uh, communicating it out. Also government, I like to get um, state government involved so um, DEQ, state, EPA, and fortunately at um, University of Cincinnati, we're right across the street from the federal EPA. So um, they have programs there too that you can get them involved as well. And they bring the, the muscle to the table, I say, because people know EPA. So when they come to the table, it's like, all right, let, this is really serious. So. You just reminded me of something that I do. <laughs> um, so this isn't tied directly to like my actual research, um, but it's an activity I do with my class, human ecology. And in that class, um, part of the facet is covering um, global environmental issues of concern. And there's a project, I can't take full credit for this. I totally pirated it off my, one of my postdoc mentors, Dr. Tim Holland, he's at Loyola University of Chicago. And essentially, uh, called, he calls it the Anthropocene Values Project, and I've kept that name. But my students, they have to um, help guide them towards picking a like uh, global issue of concern and a connection with a different habitat. And they have to create some medium 
that they then use to educate a public audience that is not our classroom. And then they come back to our class and they tell us about the experience, which they're gonna be doing in about a week and a half now. Uh, but because many of my students are, uh, we're like the solitary university. So within like a hundred mile radius, most students are living in our area and they grew up where they are. And so a lot of them partner with their favorite science teacher from like middle or high school, or a lot of them have kids. And so they go to a daycare um, or they go to the park district and they create these really cool like art pieces or um, they write songs and poetry uh, and they go out or they do a lesson plan with a teacher, but they are creating it under the guidance of someone else um, if they're going to like a fifth grade classroom, but it's an activity. And so thinking about that also reminded me how like in my research lab, um, again, I'll, I mentioned yesterday that I'm at a Hispanic serving institution. And so English is most folks second language. And some, and when our students were, my students were telling me like they learned English coming to public education school. And, um, and so they are interested in actually as a language barrier, I speak English. Um, and yes, I know some words and phrases, but you know, when I, we go out to, um, you know, outreach groups, uh, I'm not really the one doing most of the talking because usually the community is speaking a different language than what I am comfortable with. And so I th for that reason, I think it's also really important to engage your students in the outreach, especially if they're coming from that community, which also cycles back to that bridge of trust. So is this, I guess it's undergraduate students right there or is it graduate students doing the, the communicating in the world or? Uh, for that class, they're all undergraduate students. They're like little ambassadors of like little sustainability ambassador. that go out every year. So how many how many people out there um, are at a university, in a university setting, hands? Okay. How many of you have integrated, how many of your departments or programs have integrated explicitly science communication into your curriculum for undergraduates? Let's start at the departmental level and then, and then, <laughs> okay, none. Zero for undergraduates, maybe a half. Okay, how many, how many at the graduate level of some sort? Okay, now watch this. This is where I borrow the microphone. You're going to be sorry to raise your hand. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, how is, how is science communication? So, it's halfway under, halfway undergraduate. You gave me a full raise on the graduate students, though, right? And so tell me, um, Gregory, nice to meet you. Tell me, how is it integrated and what, is it successful or is it, is it kind of, well, at least we're doing it? Um, probably the person you should have to is a graduate student in the program, but um, the, as, if you want to say whether it's successful or not, but with both at the undergraduate and the graduate level, they have required a technical communications class and there's a, a, a and it's taught by a person that is really passionate about that. And so um, they do things like uh, engineering improv and com communications and that gets integrated into their senior design and other things. I also do things in my own classes that uh, even at an undergraduate level where they go in and they take an aspect of water treatment, you know, very broadly interpreted and then go in and make a two minute video that would explain that to an eighth grader or eighth grader understanding or, and we go and we, at a graduate level, one of the assignments that we do is to go in and to make a, basically a plug and play unit that a middle school science teacher could use to satisfy the engineering requirements of the uh, next generation science standards. So it's like, they demonstrate their understanding of a topic by going in and communicating it to others. Thanks. You have to speak for all graduate students, right? Uh, so a lot of pressure. Um, but and and engineering, though. So you know the joke about engineering, right? Is the the extroverted ones are the ones who look at your shoes. And so is has this been a challenge? Has this been useful for you? Is it Alyssa? Yeah, I am Alyssa from University of Iowa. So when Greg mentioned that the engineering improv class, like it's actually co-taught by um, Michelle, is an engineer, but then Christy Hartsgrove Myers, she is an actual theater professor. So they teach the class together and we do like, you know, 
Christy wants us to make the big scary topics more manageable because she has no idea what we're talking about. So we do that over and over and, you know, make iterations of what we're doing. And I think it's been successful. Um, our department also does three MTs. If you guys have done that before in different universities. Um, yeah, three MT is a three minute thesis. So um, it's university wide competition where you, you know, explain what you're talking about to a lay audience using one slide and our department wins every year. So we're doing pretty good. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a national competition too. So anyone else can do it. So Ray, you were saying, does anybody else in the audience want to tell us about an awesome communication thing? I'll come back out. Don't worry. Haters there. All right. Bonus points if I know your name already. Um, yeah, so at my uh, un, uh, during my undergrad at uh, Northeastern Illinois, uh, one of the courses we took uh, that it was recently introduced, and I'm hoping it becomes part of the uh, curriculum for all, any scientific field that they teach there it was a communicating science class. And the whole course was uh, designed to basically the students would choose, uh, you know, a research uh, or study of their interest and would practically we would be tasked throughout the semester to present that in like so many different ways, like a blog post and design a museum exhibit, make a, you know, how could you uh, design a podcast? How could you graphical abstracts and uh, just uh, even that one, like one slide to get the message across, we, all those things were in there and kind of kind of push the students to, you know, rethink the framework of the science they're interested in and how could they get that across in a more, you know, in these different ways that could apply to, you know, a variety of audi audiences. And just what everyone was saying was reminding me of that course and reminds me how effective it was because it it's an important skill to know. I know I keep running my mouth. But <laughs> oh, it's good. You're, this, um... You got put on the panel to run your mouth, but you got to put yeah. the mic on. But this kind of reminds me of um, what I do in my classroom. I do teach uh, an eco talks class and it's for upper level students, but I actually let anybody take it. So I don't give them tests. Their test is they have to present. So they have, instead of having three tests in the finals, they have three presentation in a big finals project and that they have to present. And in their presentations, like, um, I'm introducing, you know, the ecotox stuff, the contaminants, and their first presentation is um, is like a discussion presentation, and um, so they get 12 minutes. They, you know, do their presentation on that contaminant. They have to uh, cover, you know, certain things in the presentation, and they have to be able to answer questions as if they were the ones that did the studies. So. Um, when I first started doing this, the first got to UC, uh, the students didn't really like it. <laughs> um, and my evaluation sucked the first year because they were like, this is more like a speech class and blah, blah, blah. And then COVID hit. And uh, once the students kind of saw how the science, uh, as they put it, was not being presented in a way that that they understood and it was all confusing. It was this way one day, that way the other, then um, the students that I started getting after that really appreciated it. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool and I don't have to grade papers. Take that chap GPT too, right? Yeah. Uh, so Ray, you went out of your way to do this then, right? So you raise your hand for a at the individual level. And so the thing I infer from that, being uh, extraordinarily smart, is that that means you don't do it on the department basis, right? It's more on an individual basis. So, and you said you had a mentor, but why was this important to you to do within your program? Because I think science communication at all levels is really important. And well, it's one facet, right? Is um, we need to get creative on how to, so when I actually introduced this assignment, which in the beginning of the semester, no one is happy about mm -hmm. at all. And then on my student evals, usually at the end, they say, I was really scared, but it was actually more fun uh, than they thought they were going to be, which was nice, most of them anyways. Um, but because I start off by telling them that oftentimes uh, the public domain and like the discussions about scientific topics that's happening in the public uh, and if there's a debate in the public, doesn't always match with what's happening in science, right? Sometimes they're 
the de there is not really a debate in science or the debate that's going on, the public isn't really aware of. And there's a big disconnection between the scientific community oftentimes and just the public knowledge. And oftentimes we have to get creative on how we communicate. So this is an exercise in communication for my students. But I also think um, oftentimes the students get tired of just like sitting in a lecture and being pounded with information in some way, shape or form. And science can isn't just about learning and memorizing or figuring out how to use the knowledge, but you can actually like incorporate with your hobbies and it could be, you know, art, right? And so students can express the science and the knowledge they're learning through art or through music. Um, they can make children's books. And so it's a way to also diversify the student's experience with the knowledge that we're covering in class as well. Other thoughts, questions, or comments related to integrating science communication explicitly into this, uh, you know, what can be a very technical subject, right? Does anybody have thoughts or questions related to that? And are we looking good on the Hoover? Oh, back here. It's, it's just a comment on uh, the role that funding agencies are playing also in this, because having my PhD funded through Virginia Sea Grant, they played a big, big role in making sure we were communicating our work, but also giving us the training to do that. So they had like, uh, we got Alan Alda communication training, improv classes and whatnot in different ways to communicate and make sure that the science we were doing and they were funding also went out to the audience. Thank you. Improv classes, I know I'm going to get, it's the University of Iowa, so that's nice. What is the pro engineering? You, you wouldn't let me into your program. Maybe I can just go to the improv class. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit. So we were meeting last night before the reception and conversating. And one thing that we talked about was the importance of uh, interdisciplinary work when we're out there in the communities, right? And so my question for panelists and, and raise your hand or jump in is, is this, is why is interdisciplinary work important in your mind to getting your job done? whatever your job might be. And, and do you have an example of, of a time where you've gone out of your way to make something interdisciplinary and, and how was that successful? Is that, is that too big? We can break it down. Okay. <laughs> You've talked a lot. We have not heard from you in a while. Do you do a lot of interdisciplinary work or are you? Yes, uh, you know, I work on this like, uh, method of like EDA, right? It's really like combining biology and chemistry. And personally, I'm trained as an environmental chemist. I know very little about biology. So naturally, if I want to get something meaningful, and uh, that's like where I need collaboration, training, communication with toxicology biologists. So yeah, that that's kind of like why I think interdisciplinary research is so essential, especially nowadays, um, even, you know, not only in environmental science, but in other fields, you always see like no one can do it all, right? You need a highly interdisciplinary team, each one of, because probably we are at the stage like it's science is so developed, it, each one of us only know a small part and we come up together, we have the whole puzzle figured out. So that's why, um, yeah, I think this is very essential. And I'm trying to find more like, uh, collaborators and partners uh, in like biology and uh, toxicology. So I think that's kind of like what I'm trying to do. And Carolyn, we'll go back online because we haven't been pestered you in a while. A lot of what you do at Sea Grant is trying to foster interdisciplinary collaboration, right? Do you have thoughts on the best ways to do that? Or how do you introduce scientists who might otherwise not speak the same language? Um, it's a challenge. I mean, so I think I was going to say that um, I think interdisciplinary work is really important because the types of questions that are being posed in calls for funding, like whether you call them a NOFO or an RFP or whatever, are at a level that um, you really do need um, multiple people who have expertise here to add this piece and expertise here to add this piece. Um, it's a huge challenge though, 
trying to, so we've supported some projects where we explicitly said, you know, you have to have a partner in this state and this state, and you need to be working together on this question. We didn't say, you know, what each partner needed to be. We didn't say expertise, but we said, you need to have someone in Wisconsin and someone in either Illinois or Indiana. Um, and if groups were not already connected, it was very hard for us to try to set it up so that people who, or I guess, so that people who weren't already connected to each other could compete as well as those who have known each other for 20 years and already have a monitoring plan working together. Um, so we've tried to do things like um, having kind of socials where people share their research with each other and they, they are from different backgrounds and we hope that that sparks some ideas. Um, but I think it, it's really important that the scientists see value in participating in those two. Um, something at like big conferences like this that can be a challenge is if there's multiple tracks, um, you don't get, or, or bigger conferences than this one, like CTAC or something like that. You've got so many multiple tracks that it's really hard to get out of your kind of specialized area, right? So anytime there's an opportunity to do like a round table of lightning talks or like a poster session or something like that and going around it, I mean, that would be as an individual, you know, going around and trying to see, okay, who could I potentially spark with? Um, but otherwise, um, it's kind of trying, in my role, I try to get to know the different people who are working but all I can do is introduce them to each other, right? And hope that good things happen. Um, so I think, you know, people being um, being open to it too. Um, one final thing when, you know, interdisciplinary researchers working together is one thing and collaborating. Um, but then when you start to talk about going into communities, if you have like 10 different groups all trying to go into this community, the community gets tired, right? So um, that's the other kind of aspect to this where, the, the end users of the information, who I think several people have noted, kind of should be involved from the beginning of the project, they should be considered as a team member too, and their time also kind of not stretched in. So I don't know if that answers your question. This is where I put in my plug as a social scientist and someone who works for an outreach organization. <laughs> Uh, call us before the night the proposal is due and give us more than one paragraph in 1200 bucks, uh, please. So That's John, you work in a, a government and a lot of times government can have sort of bureaucratic inertia towards siloing, right? Uh, is there something, what do you do to combat that sort of inertia and to see that your work is used kind of across departments or across disciplines? Are there things that you can do? Well, sometimes you can luck out and be a really small state where the worst thing you could do is add more state employees. So by default, some of us do so many jobs, we can't silo. Um, but I think one of the other approaches is that thing of trying to reach out and share results and let people know what you have done. But I'll, like one of the things I try to push for from my position is making sure like as we're doing projects here, we're sharing preliminary data with groups that can pursue some of those federal grants for research. Um, I keep nagging our local C grant group to see if anyone is interested in some of these other topics. But it can get tricky and it can also be challenging too when we have groups that are very focused on one contaminant and they're not interested in looking at another when Maybe that's where we do have funding and resources. Um, I think this is a common problem where, you know, right now a lot of funding grants are out there for emerging contaminants in air quotes, but really what a lot of them mean is PFAS, right? Like if you're not doing a PFAS project, your other emerging contaminant, which may be just as important, will probably get overlooked. Um, and that can be difficult. And that's something that, you know, we struggle with as a state agency because oftentimes we're directed by the legislature on what our priorities are and that's where our funding comes from, even though there may be other things that we have concerns for. Um, so that can be a tricky part. But the other thing that can be an issue is when we're trying to get people to join in or trying to get stakeholders involved and maybe they're just battered and overwhelmed and they can't take on something else. So. You know, in 2020, 2021, we didn't do a lot of nagging of the Division of Public Health Services because they were kind of busy with something else, aka COVID and vaccine distribution. 
And there's a lot of public health agencies around the country and at state and federal level where there's been burnout since COVID. So it's being mindful of that. And even one of the other challenges that we run into is, you know, right now we're trying to do outreach to physicians and primary care clinicians about PFAS and private well testing. And a lot of them just don't need another thing on their plate. But we have community groups that are pushing really hard where, you know, they want their primary care physician to also be their private well specialist and their environmental exposure specialist. And sort of the analogy that I use is, you know, it's kind of like when we're asking police officers to be social workers, drug abuse therapists, housing specialists, immigration specialists, all on top of being a police officer with whatever training they got for that. And, you know, science is just a question of how much do we need to push for these people to be heavily involved versus just being better at letting them know that there are specialists and experts available that they can turn to instead of really pushing this effort on, hey, you have to commit your time and resources to this, and you need to be as much an expert as we are. Okay, we've been sitting for 70 minutes, um, which is longer than even a long episode of a prestige drama. So what we're gonna do is, is for, we have two topics left that I wanna cover, and then we get a break, is that right? Yeah, they can have snacks. They're gonna have snacks at the break. No snacks. It's okay. They got water. It's fine. Okay. Um, so here's what we're going to do is we're talking a lot about communicating with the public and technical jargon. So I just, if you want, I'm not going to make you do this, of course, but if you need to stand up and stretch, stand up and stretch and then yell out, I'm going to go one, two, three, and we're going to yell out a really technical jargony term. And then we're going to sit down and go cover our last two topics, just to give us a chance to stand up, to stretch. Uh, for those of you who are trying to sneak out, just you can do it now, but I don't do it. We've got two topics left. So let's, uh, or you can just take a little sit and stretch. That's fine too. Uh, but I'm going to go one, two, three in about four seconds. And you're going to yell out a technical term. And then we're going to re resume again. So we'll stand up now or stretch in our chair. It's good. Let the back, stretch out the back, maybe the hamstrings. Or if you're like me, they're very connected. All right. And then we're going to go uh, one, two, three. And I want to hear these technical terms. And I want to hear loud um, because why not? All right. So we're going to go one and two and three. That's just how I envisioned it. Thank you. Okay. Just right. Okay, good. Now I have two topics. So the one thing Sarah said, make sure you talk about this. And I don't think we're actually going to end up talking about it. Um, but I want to use it to set up the thing that I'm, I'm thinking about, because this is something we think about in my field a lot. And I'm, I'm curious to get your opinions on it. So Sarah said, you know, we want to talk about working with the public in the context of a world where we have disasters, right? Because just now there was the, uh, just, you know, recently the train derailment in, in East Palestine, Ohio. Um, and, and, and that got me to thinking about working with communities. So I do a lot of work with communities on things. You know, we, we go in, we're social scientists, and we talk about our feelings, and we leave. And... Um, it's a lot like home. And, uh, and so with that, though, we, you know, something we worry about a lot is that we do this from a position of power, right? I'm a, you know, a, a steadily funded academic uh, who can waltz into a community of need, get my info, and then, you know, sometimes you leave, right? And what are they left with? They gave you their info. And, and you know, so, and I, I can see that being a, is that an issue? where it's like, I'm gonna go in and get my samples. And, 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 and to the extent of this, what can you do to make sure the communities are getting something back for what they give you, their time, their energy? How do you ensure that the communities are collaborating with you, not just um, the source of your tenure document, if that makes sense? Well, I'll, I'll speak to that. Um, I, I've been speaking to lots of people lately saying that it's like that little swoop in thing, you swoop in, you swoop out, and then you're expecting something from the community. And uh, you can't do that. Like you have to keep going back, you know, because if you're, you're receiving from them just as much as they're receiving from you, but if you're going in once and you're out of there, that dynamic is not even because you're receiving way more for them. There's one of you and there's many of them. So you need to keep coming back. You need to keep pouring into them. You need to keep building the trust. You need to, um, you know, just just don't don't just come in and leave because too many times this is happening in those communities. So they get used to it and they're expecting it. 
And it's like, okay, oh, somebody else is going to come in and leave. So whatever, we'll take what you're giving and see you. And they're not expecting to see you again. But if they do, and you're building that that connection, you're building that trust, and you're building, um, you know, those, uh, you're building that community with, as your community as well. You'll get a long way. You'll go a long way with them. And you'll also um, be able to, have a more equal dynamic because like I said, just because you're coming in in a position of quote unquote power, um, like if I'm in here and I'm telling you all something about me, all right, or my research or whatever, well, and I'm receiving from you, I'm getting way more from all of you than you're just getting from my little one spill. So I need to keep coming back. I need to keep coming back. I need to keep putting in there. I need to keep that fire burning. And then before you know it, we're all a community. This, um, you know, talking about the feedback to the community, especially within this like disasters, right? Like, uh, like environmental disaster or whatever is caught. Um, so I can like talk about two examples that I know. Uh, for example, this very recent like derail chemical spill. Um, I think I have been following uh, Andrew Welton, who is a professor at, right, I heard the not, no, not over there. Um, he's been like very active on Twitter and he's been work, not only working on this, this issue with the local community, but also getting almost like a real time kind of like what he knows, what he kind of like conclude on Twitter. So that's like working with the community, also getting the information back in a pretty approachable Way, right, so that's uh, kind of like uh, what's going on. He's a professor at Indiana, Purdue, I think, right? Yes, he's at Purdue. Go yeah. Boilers! I'm yeah. So, so yeah, if you are following that, that's one uh, you know very good example, I would say. Uh, and another one is go back. I don't know, like how many years? Maybe almost like eight, seven years ago at Flint, uh, the water crisis. Um, so I think Mark Edwards from Virginia Tech. Um, he's been, you know, helping the local community with lead analysis because they do all this like piping, like metal analysis in drinking water. And uh, so the good thing is he's been, you know, his information has helped a lot uh, with the local people. They have this like evidence, they have the measurement, they know what's going on. Uh, and even later they have the mechanisms, everything, right? So that's the good side. But the downside is if you're in the uh, science community itself, he also gets some like backlash. Uh, people are saying, oh, your data has not been peer reviewed. You're getting funding because you, right? Like you, you are getting federal funding. You should be publishing papers. You're not like an activist. So you, you should be like more like a scientist. Um, so yeah, it's been a debate for a bit, but I, I don't know how this will you know, in the long run, people will how 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 to comment on this, but I think um, th there's a responsibility for scientists to kind of like work with community, uh, no matter how you kind of disclose your data or is it in report or is it in peer reviewed article, but at least you know something you can do over there. So that's the second example. I so I would just kind of jump in, sort of follow up on that, not from not from the perspective of a researcher responding to a community, but sort of from the perspective of like a government agency. So a lot of our data is publicly available and we've had several instances where university groups have come in, they've asked us for full data sets and we share it. We can't keep data from people. But what'll happen is, you know, at the 11th hour after their paper's been accepted for publication, they'll give us a heads up and say, oh, by the way, we did a study with the data, we're publishing it, do you have any last minute comments? And when we go through, there's QAQC issues, they misappropriately map data, there's all kinds of problems that the journal isn't going to pull that back. The authors aren't interested in changing the analysis because it's just been accepted for publication. 
And then there's no plan for risk communication or explaining it to the public. So then the state agencies are left to explain something that it can put them in a tough spot of, do they call out the shortcomings and say something about that? Or do they try to figure out how to interpret and represent that work? And it can be really challenging because you know in New England, we're a small region. So we can have institutions from other states coming in and doing that work. And that can be really challenging because then it, it creates that further challenge for us to build a bridge of trust when the communities come to us and say, this elite school over here did this research and you're telling us it's wrong because they didn't do QA, QC on the data or they didn't do the following things. Well, you're the government, we don't trust you, we trust that school. So then it makes it harder for us to go in down the road when we're trying to do things like treatment or have public meetings. So there's a whole other potential panel there on like, who do we trust and why, right? And I, we won't, but I've got a lot of, but there are a lot of questions about that. But so one sort of theme I'm, I'm hearing, and this really started with our first question, where uh, you were talking about, uh, Lakanda, you were talking about going into communities and you said, you know, you oftentimes look like the people, but, but regardless, and now you're talking about going back to the communities over and over again. If I could summarize that, and maybe to a certain extent, some of the other comments, it's like trying to be a person, right? Uh, which is hard sometimes. Um, but so here's a pushback uh, to play devil's advocate here. Is there a chance that trying to do that can compromise objectivity? Is that something you worry about? Or maybe anybody else who wants to comment on that, please do. I can comment on that. Um, you're a trained scientist. So just because you're going back into the communities and you're still you know, building, building that community with them does not mean that you have to automatically be subjective to anything. So you are trained to be objective. So why should that stop just because you're building a community with the community that you're serving? And that would be my question for that. <laughs> so your question, then I raise you a question. And we do have a couple of questions coming in on the Whova app. Just a reminder, if you're online, if you want to uh, type one in there, just go for it. That's what those two thumbs on your phone are for. Uh, does anybody else have thoughts on objectivity and working in communities? Or is uh, Latanya's nice question back to our question where we want to leave that? So, so I think what she said uh, was perfect, actually. Yep. Okay. okay, then we'll move on. So this is from a, a I'm sorry, I'm going to butcher your name and I apologize, but it's from a Dem Dema Yanti. Oh, you're not on Hoopa, you're right here. Well, wait a minute, don't type this in on Hoopa, we can bring you a microphone. Come on now. So hello, I'm Dama. I'm a third year PhD student from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm in Erika's lab. Uh, we work with the degradation of plastics in landfills. And for me, science communication has been something really important. So since I joined like the PhD, I did a PhD minor to know more about those concepts. And these years, uh, Fuad and I have joined this very good program called Public Service Fellows. And what is that class about or that program about is that uh, the spring and summer semesters are based on learning about concepts with communications uh, towards the public and how we can engage with them. Also, we are in different paths like direct service, which involves science communications and outreach, which is the path I am and Fuad is in the politics part, uh, path. I'm sorry I'm putting you here in this part, but I just want to like integrate you. And um, this program is also good because on the fall, we are going to like join and do an internship where like direct service is going to like uh, pair up with a local uh, leader from the community and do more work with them. But I always have been curious. So I had like, I did this because I have been always like, I want to do that in my like, future goals and for me like it's important since like for me my dream or my goal is that science should be like shared and everyone should know about science it's like a right that everyone has to know and I always go back to that because for example I think about my grandma so back in Puerto Rico those things like cultural things she went up to third grade 
and like Ching went to like universities or more higher studies. So she doesn't know more much about science. And I feel like it's our responsibility to share that science. Anyways, how like I can like start doing these science communications with local communities. I have the opportunity this fall to pair with these local communities uh, leader. But after that, I'm not sure like how we can maintain like a long-term like relationship to say one way with this partnership. Or for example, if these partnerships end up in one semester, how me as a PhD student like can engage more with them and uh, make science approachable with everyone. So how can we get started in communicating science in, during graduate school? So this is good, not a school with an improv class, but, um, uh, but, but what, what kind of steps can people take? I'm looking right at you, Carol. Is listening to, so when you start working with the community, asking them like, what would you like to know about? Um, how do you like to receive information? Um, and the community could be, you know, uh, like a town or something like that. It could also be a group of wastewater treatment professionals or things like that. Um, and so I think that's a really important place to start is to understand what they would like to know about and how they would like to receive the information. And then if you identify some gaps where there's like a really, there's a really important thing that you would like to share um, that they haven't identified as this is something I would like to know about, you can start to figure out like how, you know, how to communicate it that way. Other thoughts or comments related to that? Yeah, and Wisconsin has a very good Sea Grant program too. So they, yeah, you should go talk to them. Um, another question, okay. We have, we have six minutes and one topic, so let's, yeah. Um, like, uh, do you all like, so all your presentations were super awesome. Very good job, like best presentations ever. And I have been like wondering, related, but at the same time, a like, little off topic, uh, time management. So I know you're all PIs with all of these, like uh, very busy schedules. So how you like, get this community or time to get involved with that um, and like any recommendations in general. Create rules for yourself and try not to break them. So the first rule I made for myself, I finished my master's, stayed in the same lab for my PhD. So it was the first year of PhD. And a rule I made for myself was that I am not bringing work home at all, unless it was like an emergency. Like I had to present at a conference the next day. Okay. Um, and then I could practice at home in front of my cats, like out loud. Um, so that was like one rule because I'm a person who needs other people to help moderate my time. Um, and I recognize that about myself. <laughs> uh, and so, and another rule, because I'll, I'll just wake up and I would just go into the lab like almost every day as a master's student. And that started carrying into the PhD. And that was not sustainable at all. And so I came up with another rule. On the weekend, I am not going to go into the lab on the weekend unless I have to do field work. Okay, uh, that would be, uh, that's acceptable because students, you know, if I have like, 10 students coming with me, you can't get them to go out unless it's like on the weekend. Um, or if I have to go into the lab, I am not going in before lunchtime, right? So these are just some very simple rules I started with as a graduate student. And then through time, I just keep building up on them as much as I can. And it helps to have people around you who are accepting of the type of job that you have, but also, will help you, you know, remind you to take care of yourself because it's really easy to put yourself last, which also means you have to start saying no to things. And saying no to things isn't losing opportunities, okay? It's actually like a good thing. So I actually attend, I'm part of the early career committee for the Society of Freshwater Science. And last year um, on Zoom, we had like a work-life ba balance session, which is kind of what you're talking about here. And one of the aquatic ecologists had actually said this. She was just like, keep 
a list of all the like, you know, opportunities that come your way that you just don't have time for. Um, and you, you don't want to be too much of like a giving tree. Okay. And write them down and those and pull it out and just be proud that you said no. Like you should feel good that you said no. And some of those opportunities, they're going to come again. It's not like you have to say yes to everything right now because you have your whole career to for some of those opportunities to come again or to create them yourself maybe in the future. So I have a whole lot more to say, but I'm gonna stop. Um, for me, it was, uh, I, I learned it late in grad school, but, um, and, and grad school tends to be a little bit different when you are from a marginalized group um, and a lot of, not just grad school, but undergrad too, a lot of times you're expected to do way more just to get the same recognition. So um, so what I learned to do um, at about year three in my PhD was just make a schedule every day. I follow it to the T. I make a schedule for my hobbies. <laughs> Within that, rest time, coffee. I'm a coffee holic. I will put that in my schedule. I will put time in my schedule just for incidentals. And if I don't have an incidental, then I got some free time on my hand, whether it's 20 minutes or 15 minutes. So I am a stickler for writing out my schedule and um, learning how to say no, because when you, uh, when you are underrepresented, everybody wants you to represent some type of diversity for them. And um, you just have to decide what's gonna benefit you the most, not the person that's asking. So I have this policy that if that person asks me, so my next question is, so how does that benefit me? And if they can't give me a good enough reason, or if I can't think of one right then and there, the answer is no. Now, if I think about it later, like, oh, yeah, you know what? That would be a good thing. It would benefit me this way, that way. Then I'll go back and be like, hey, for the offer still on the table is yes. But other than that, no. So be quick to say no, slow to say yes, write everything down, uh, schedule your, your time, your study time, your time just to sit down, your time to, if you have children or, or whatever you have, husband, boyfriend, whatever, girlfriend, whatever it is you have, like schedule that in your day, but don't make your whole day all about work. That's not balanced. So be as balanced as you can be. And um, it's getting warm outside. I even schedule my time to be outside in my garden with my dogs. Unfortunately, I'm not to the point where I'm like, I don't go in the lab on the weekend. <laughs> I wish I could be, but I work with live organisms, so they don't listen. So, you know, <laughs> so I have to be in the lab sometimes on weekends. And there are some times that I'm working seven days a week, but I'm not working 12 hours a day, seven days a week. So um, that's what's worked for me. And, uh, but you'll, and I tweak it every now and again because things change. I finish a project and I make it one that's less time consuming or I make it one that's more time consuming. So you, you constantly have to tweak that. Just to tag on right there. Also, in my personal opinion, the concept of free time isn't that time to give to someone else. It's time for you. It's like self-care time. So the number of times students like just walk into my office because they don't knock. They don't like respect the sanctity of the doorway, right? Uh, Dr. McNish, you look like you're free, right? I'm like sitting at my computer. I have a schedule. This is my like data analysis time, right? Um, and so because someone looks like they're free, doesn't mean it's like an opportunity to take advantage of that person's like quote, time that they're, doesn't look like the schedule for something because free time really is like self-care time. And it's not time that you should be giving up to others unless there's like an important reason or like it's gonna benefit you in some way. So I just wanted to tag that on. Thank you for tagging that on. With that, uh, we will not get to the last topic because it is time. But uh, thank you to our panelists. And thank you to Sarah and Beth for organizing this. And, and I will point out, uh, without even trying, it's a wonderfully diverse panel. And men don't serve on panels. Here's a great example of why not.
Thank you. Just say no. But thank you all so much for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.